Dr. Sita, uh, where do you see this industry going in terms of uh, this uh, news that came yesterday? Do you think more such announcements would come? And how do you see this, uh, this particular merger going forward? This is a change in phase of the world and change in phase of financial services. In my pursuit of interpretation, it's expected. If you look at changing dynamics, scale does matter. You need to have business combinations, which will be in a position to service all the stakeholders. From a regulatory perspective, you need larger capital base because banking becomes total, totally global. With digital governance taking a shape, it's, your market access becomes total in terms of a global customer base. So you have access to all the markets, it depends upon how you conceive, how do you uh, create a prototype to have a global space, number one. Number two, changing the cost structure. We are clearly seeing revenues are going to be shared between the technology companies, postals, and the conventional banks. So it's difficult to distinguish between the technology companies and the banks. So essentially revenues are going to shrink. Cost has to be rationalized. You have business force outsourcing, knowledge force outsourcing, and again, you have a flat wall where you can have resources world over. Survival of the fittest. It means you need to have cost efficient and convenient mechanism for you to operate as a business. And again, when you consolidate financial service back between the banks, again, aggregation of services as one stop financial service is also possible. Yes. Whether banking or insurance stocks or mutual funds will also be combining into forces so that the customer get the value advantage. When it comes to overall governance model, now social risk management is going to play a very important uh, factor. So we are all conscious of the fact that we, risk management enterprise-wide has to be integrated in substance. The currency risk, counterparty risk, and again, the, the technical recession, the great recession will have a serious consequence in your asset class. And uh, you have to necessarily devalue a complete business and then try to optimize the forces. If you look at the bigger picture, if you have a, sustainable journey in your mind, then industry consolidation is bound to happen. That's what has happened in Saudi. And again, we have seen the trigger in, in Qatar as well. In a market space like Qatar, where you have 10 local banks, seven foreign banks, it's, it's, it's too much. So you need to have a, a large scale operations with a conventional or Islamic. And again, aggregation of various services as I mentioned will be the uh, new face uh, uh, of financial service in Qatar. We can uh, ask uh, Dr. Sita to, to, to share, uh, I mean, uh, some insights into what uh, uh, what Omar just mentioned around di digital acceptance and digital innovation. You you're starting to have board meetings and uh, and and uh, I mean within the industry also within the bank you're having a number of meetings. How quick was this digital acceptance uh, uh, in, in, in your bank? Well, uh, banking convergence with technology is, is the new slogan as such. It's difficult to distinguish, as I said earlier, between the technology companies and the bank. And uh, as far as Doha Bank is concerned, we're the first one to bring in SMS banking, web banking, mobile, GPRS, way back in 2002 on purchase Transaction-based processing are all going to be uh, digitally acute and customer will find the convenience as well as cost efficiency. That's good for the bank, good for the customers. And again, when it comes to tracking of uh, the overall uh, logging of the transactions, it becomes more meaningful. So the fourth industrial revolution, as we call it typically, is already shaken up the, the, the momentum in terms of banking products and services. Customer value proposition is now converging towards Internet of Things, blockchain, artificial intelligence, robotic process automation. That's now the crisis COVID-19 is only accelerating the process. So brilliance of gadgets are available 
on your personal lifestyle as well as professional makeup. We have a, a, in a hybrid model, we are evolving to see that the backing is absolutely a convenient mechanism through this digital advantage. So digital governance is going to be a major thrust as uh, Omar has mentioned, cybersecurity measurements are going to be vital for us to see through. So it's a new world, a lot of customer convenience, and it's a value addition and it's a win-win model. We have to embrace the change and make sure we create a positive value stream for all the stakeholders. Um, we will go towards the Q&A a little later, but before that, we, we, we I would like to move on to Dr. Cesar uh, to have a discussion on how his bank has uh, navigated the pandemic uh, crisis, uh, the COVID-19 crisis. And uh, I mean, are, are there specific changes you're going to make to your business model, the banking business model that uh, uh, Basel was just alluding to it? So do you have a game plan in, in your mind? Thank you, Moshin. Uh, thank you, fellow speakers, uh, boss. Basel has uh, summed it up in terms of uh, global economics as well as uh, the local economy. In substance, let's look at in four parts. One is the impact. Impact. The second one, I think I should attempt, some of the poll was showcasing the financial markets, whether oil or gas or uh, precious metals or fixed income or equities. We'll see what is the likely outcome in the coming days. And again, well, let us also look at the changing business model and what sort of regulatory compliance is going to come in, including ESG. Environmental social governance is going to play a bigger role. Uh, and again, social risk management will be integrated into the risk management framework. The last but not the least, uh, what sort of digital acceleration I see and what exactly the Doha Bank is uh, doing in substance. Impact in global terms is very much clear. We have been continuously getting measurements from IMF to start with in April. That was defined by OECD. OECD said in the first wave itself, it will, will be resulting not less than 6% contraction. That is great recession in, in substance. And again, uh, last week when the IMF was uh, precipitating in terms of global growth, it was an absolute contraction to the tune of 4.9%. That says it all. This year is going to be challenging. When there is a contraction in, in global frame, let's understand we are living in an interconnected, interdependent world. Nobody is immune to it. No asset class is immune to it. It's a question of making sure that how much impact it's, it's going to have in your trade or investments, banking or finance. The economic momentum will have direct impact in the in the monetary policy as well as fiscal policy. The comments have taken world over in alignment between the monetary and fiscal measures and they have promulgated to improve the liquidity so that the funding is available. It doesn't result in solvency issue. Countries can collapse as well if you are not taking alignment between monetary policy and fiscal policy. And that is precisely the reason world over and not less than 10 to 12% GDP has been the minimum stimulus. It means individual institutions, you have to put money on the table. You have to improve the, you know, exhibition capacity. You have to give concession values. There's a total disruption in terms of the business. It's a paralysis. It's not even a disruption. It's a complete, if you have lockdown, it says it all. It's a complete uh, paralysis in substance and no industry is immune to it. If you look at it, everyone is interconnected within the framework. And economies have to contract, it means SDs have to contract, it means banking has to contract. There's no possibility of uh, you know, acceleration in terms of growth, even individual monetary. If you do it, it's a short term focus. So objective demands, conservative and cautious corporate management is the name of the game. Now, in substance, the impact will be in terms of economic governance, globally, regionally, locally, even in corporate matters. Second impact is to be on the social governance. It, is, it means right from the social distancing, every institution, 
Hygiene was factored, and again, chicken was managed in non common substance, and we are entering more new recombination and fermentation. We will have more reduction in creating, uh, you know, carbon emission, reduction will come in carbon neutral society will be created. That's good for the environment and good for society as well. Social governance, whether it's health care or education or water management or waste management, you will have that serious reorganization in terms of the business model. When it comes to human development, this is the key. Ultimate piece, we have to understand everything is humanity and human process. They have serious consequences we are seeing now. I think about 10.5 million people are impacted in, around the world. No country is immune to it. When it comes to individual uh, countries, we have the statistics which is alarming. The second year has already started. And over 530,000 people, as on date, hit the account of this crisis. The second year will have a much bigger consequential impact. We are ruling out 2020 in terms of the economic momentum and the contraction, and possibly if there is a clinical and medical solution, then we are going to have a major, major reorganization in terms of economic momentum. As you mentioned, we see that's only a cash flow indicative uh, measurements. But I'm of the opinion it's not going to recover even in 2021. It may not be a contraction in total respects if we clinically get a solution by the end of this year. Clinical testing around the world, 130 clinical laboratories now working on it. If we administer 6.8 million people in this back, there is a possibility we may derive from new normal, normal in a gradual. Uh, substance. So that is the one we should keep, keep in mind. It's not a short-term crisis. It's yet to stay a minimum of two years and normalcy will be restored if and only if these predictions which are mentioned. So there is a huge healthcare and, and uh, you know we have to necessarily look at the human governance in a different prospects. Disruption in every part for human subsistence. So well and that's it means we have to map every possible uh, aspect of humanity. Education, care, food security, water management, as I said, waste management, under the water, all the water, also including other critical regime for adding. Everything is important for us to see. We need to build a global partnership, global partnership. Everyone is interconnected. So that's the next one. When it comes to Economic governance, individual institutions have to redefine. Countries have to redefine their game. But let's also understand in a global makeup, you have trade, which is contracting nearly 30 to 32 percent contraction this year. That's what the WTO says. WTO chief was mentioning two months before 13 percent. Now he revised his outlook. Now, trade is going to be impacted by whether merchandise or services. You will have an impact. Financial economies, even financial institutions have to necessarily understand if trade is impacted, your foreign exchange is impacted, your business model is impacted in terms of exporting, and that is disruption to uh, national service as well. Now, when it comes to when it comes to the rest of the alignment in terms of economic governance, investments, there are huge financial risk in the, in the markets simply because. The currencies are overvalued. Already we have done printing money in 2009. Dollar is overvalued, for example. Dollar has to crash. Let's understand. The gross debt to GDP, if you look at it, it has to crash. That's the single currency which is driving 70% of the global trade. So let us understand this will have consequential impact in every single measurement. If you don't factor it, your white risk becomes more monumental and you will not be able to recover in individual economies. So that is financial markets are nothing but gambling grounds today. Whoever, whatever be the prediction, let's understand the reality. It is going to be a gambling ground. Stocks are overvalued around the world. Global equities, you mentioned, that's roughly overvalued. A PE price to earning is 28 times in American market. Is it sustainable? Is it sustainable? No. That's Qatar. Because price to earning, we have, we have seen, economic fundamentals are matching. Stock market 
the barometer of an economy, if that is not linked in substance, if you are overshooting because you have hard money transcending borders, that's not sound. But as economic fundamentals are strong, countries like Qatar, where you have strong commodity driven value streams in terms of revenues, there is a possibility. And our price sharing and price book value, if you look at it, it's grossly under before the COVID crisis. So I'm here to say global equities are grossly under, uh, you know, overpriced, and Qatar equity is grossly under. Look at it, and you see, even if there's a regression of 10 to 15 percent in the coming year, you will have a price to earning, it's worth taking to 15 foot to 18 times. That's still not a market average in global terms. Now, when it comes to the investments of asset class, we know interest rate has been fixed. There's no increase in the interest rate. We have seen America has spelled out clearly they cannot increase the interest rate. They are not thinking. Federal Reserve Chairman has mentioned very clearly. They are not even thinking of thinking of rising the interest rate. And that's not exactly the word. It clearly signals market indications are next three years there will not be interest rate hike. It tells you fixed income is going to be a product to watch. People want safe and secure, capital protected, debt papers. Underlying economies will drive the change. Fundamentals are driven when it comes to fixed income, majority of the cases. It's not, it's, it can't widely gamble because the parameters which you have to look at it are all synchronized by and large. So fixed income will be steady. You have to look at countries rating and the corporate rating if it is a corporate bond. If it is a sovereign rating, you have to look at it. If it is a US treasury, you have to look at it. Countries GDP to gross debt, you have to measure it. If it is abnormal, you have to be careful. Countries like Qatar, for example, gross debt to GDP is 52%. We can see clearly the way forward. Sovereign debt, Qatar can still issue. They can mobilize. Last time when they issued in, in May, it was oversubscribed by uh, you know six times. Now we can see Qatar can go for additional uh, dollar procurement, if at all, and they will have good subscriptions. And again, it's a good investment from, from a market perspective for the international investors of private equity for each one of I'm only answering the question, some of the poll questions which have been asked in terms of economic governance. So when it comes to, Hussein, if I can add, Qatar has announced it since 2006, 16, rather. We have been issuing uh, you know, this document since 2009. We look at the inf information which we put in here. It is set to global universal standard as such. Here we have signed in, uh, with UNESCO in 2006-07. We have made sure we green banking as a practice, structure, practice we did it. So the investments are lending, water conservation of history cooling or uh, eco-school program in terms of, it is going to be, see, you are part of the society. You have to care for the society. Uh, then only a good corporate citizen can add value to a you know, good economy. It's money making is one aspect. At the same time, how you make it, how you add value to society. And creating financial literacy has been our core forefront. If creating, uh, you know, sustainable value is our forefront. And that's how we, we channelize our energy and we are, complying in respect, and that should be a new norm. That should I think we, we have more questions coming in from the audience, so I'll just uh, read a few of them. Uh, I think one of the interesting questions uh, are, is around the uh, uh, job market in the financial services industry. Uh, as we know, the whole industry starts to remodel and reshape. Uh, what kind of skills would you be looking for uh, going forward? And uh, when will you be hiring? That's an interesting discussion our, our attendees wanted to understand. Was it supposed to whom? Uh, both of you, Sita and Basil, you guys are the banks. Sita, beauty before age, yeah, please. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, uh, they see, let's understand the dynamics of the new world. It's a flat world. It's, it's moving from, it's a change of shape. Now, you don't have borders. Knowledge process sourcing will have a digital advantage, and you can pick up. You now with the with the split 
of the staff, you can also learn lessons. You are not location centric, you are information centric. So essentially, irrespective of where you come from, you can hire for any institution. So you will get the best of talent and you will have a cost effective way forward because the prices will be flat down. It's a skill matrix and job descriptions which will iron out the, the price. It, it will not be uh, you know, different whether it is America or Bangladesh or India or Japan. You will have, this skill will have the uniformity in price. The price discrimination which we are seeing today because of segmentation, you are focused on locations. It's no more required. There are certain you know, competencies which are required to have a front and face. Internal integration will happen. Majority of the engines will come from the knowledge process outsourcing, and these services will be channelized in a pipe. And big factories will support these outsourced processes. And you will find continuous uh, recruitment for big corporates, and they will outsource the knowledge. They also the business in multiple forms. Core competencies you will keep. If you look at the intellectual back. In a basket, you will keep only core competencies, technical skill. For example, for a bank, I need a foreign exchange dealer. I need, uh, you know, again, relationship managers. And I don't need uh, certain segments. <clears throat> I don't need. So you, what you will do is peripheral competencies. You will outsource it in total terms, and it will be cost effective for you. And uh, similarly, your recruitment will be confined to a global market, not less than a local market. So this kind of so knowledge economy will get evolved and that will redefine the game. So it's a huge transformation in substance. Every institution has to recruit because the changing business model is coming. This is another major uh, transformation. Every part of corporate banking or retail banking or treasury or investments or international technology or operations, everything is going to be a, a complete change. If you calculate the dynamics of this change, then you have to re reinvent the wheel in terms of the staffing patterns and staff spans. Uh, Sita, uh, a, a more futuristic question. Uh, do you ever see banks going completely digital, completely transforming from what they are today to, to being completely digital? That's the model evolving. I mean, uh, the digital only bank will be uh, a transaction-based processing. Everything can be done to digital governance, and it, it will be the most efficient mechanism, uh, value advantage to customers. Again, investing in such mechanisms will will change as well. The written market market story is over. This is creation. Essentially, digital only bank will be very conventional process procedures follows this. Everything will get into high uh, digital automation and the currency become totally digital. That's what the virtual reality is all about. That's what is artificial this is all about. That is what is where robotic process automation is all about. You converge as a digital only bank. And that's going to be the way forward for you to do whether it's corporate banking or retail. Uh, treasury or every part of the banking system can be converged through the technology and the tools available in today's context. Why to waste customer time and your time and move straight into a virtual world and give the value advantage as one stop financial service, collaborate and complement the value to the customers? And that's the model. It's going to be the breadwinner. Perhaps there will be a huge uh, competition between technology companies which are still to be regulated. That's the concern I have because technology companies have to be regulated and telecom companies have to be regulated. There has to be a, you know, clear uh, governance in terms of uh, monetary and uh, uh, fiscal uh, alignment to govern these institutions. And that's what is missing link. Otherwise, you will have virtual uh, companies uh, will, be, will be doing uh, financial services, digital only services, and catering to all a sort of customer segments which a conventional brick and mortar can uh, adhere to.